Uh, first of all, uh, like Tejesh mentioned, I I work at Nilanzo. I am also part of the Bandar core team. Uh, uh, and today I want to talk about uh, uh, how to build resilient systems, which is useless. So, yeah, I guess it got tangled. So, uh, today I want to talk about uh, how to build resilient systems. Uh, so, why why do we care about resilient systems in the first place? Uh, so, if uh, anyone who lo loses sleep over their systems downtime, or any customers or business, uh, they would care about resiliency of their system because downtime would probably mean uh, uh, would be disasters for them, and probably some developers would have to wake up at night <laughs> to answer the on call. Uh, that is one. So uh, you would want to build systems that, in case of failures or a very high traffic, it would still work. It would still uh, uh, perform, and uh, hence uh, we do care about resilient systems. So how do we go about building one? So let's uh, move away from software for a bit now. Let's say about cars. Uh, you have a car. Uh, those are uh, very resilient uh, in uh, when an uh, accident occurs. Like it would have an airbag system, every, uh, and it will kick in and you know save your life. Uh, nuclear power reactors. If the power goes out, uh, it doesn't just you know start leaking radiation all over. There would be mechanisms to build it. Do you think those guys built that mechanism? You know, once the nuclear power plant was entirely built, it was it started, it was working, and then somebody said, "Oh, hey, what if there is a power outage? Do we have handled that case?" No, they would have thought about it from the start, but. Unfortunately, in software resilience, uh, the way the things it works is, folks uh, build the entire feature, everything is done. Luckily, if it's in the QA state, someone would get the idea, oh, what if that cache server that uh, we are highly relying upon to meet our uh, SLA service level agreement, uh, well, what if it goes down? Yeah, then you, if you realize you didn't handle that, then that's too late. Most of the time, you realize all of this while it's on production. You uh, once uh, find day when you actually need your caches to be working, when your load on your server is extremely high. That's when you uh, would want it to perform its best. That's when the cache server would actually go down. And when it goes down, some devs would get fired, but the uh, rest of who remains would have to handle all that uh, uh, carnage. So. The only way to design a resilient system is from the start. You have to begin with resilience in mind. Uh, while designing, you have to think about, OK, what if my, the service I'm talking to goes down? What if my, uh, what if my uh, database does not respond? Or what if there's a bad query running on my database? All those things uh, you have to think. And, uh, and a lot of things, uh, like while I'm going to talk about patterns that can help you with, a lot of things are very domain specific. Those are things that you have to plan out in advance that you can handle in code. So uh, yes, so coming to it, this is going to be the main crux of the talk, resilient design patterns. So while I don't say the guarantee that you using this design patterns would guarantee that you know your core machine will not go down uh, every time, but it will reduce, uh, it will improve your uh, system's uptime considerably. So uh, let me give an example why you would want design patterns over a one-time solution. So we, uh, we had a system yeah, in production. Over a period of time, the memory usage of that, uh, you know, we had Unicorn as our web server. Over a period of time, the Unicorn web server's uh, uh, memory usage would increase, like day by day. And by a week or two, the uh, memory usage would be, uh, uh, would be so high that it would start swapping. And uh, at that point, uh, the only uh, option you would have is to restart the web server. And uh, so, so that was very painful. So, uh, uh, while looking at why this was happening, we had a lot of uh, uh, 
uh, things like, uh, okay, maybe it's one of the native extensions in Ruby uh, which is leaking the memory. Uh, we didn't find anything. Uh, we thought, okay, uh, are we creating symbols anywhere? Uh, we checked, we were only uh, 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 doing JSON parsing, uh, uh, and that's, that was the only time while we were creating symbols. And generally, uh, you would know that uh, most of the times uh, when you parse a JSON, the keys would be non-unique. So uh, that's a better option. Uh, so uh, let me just add that uh, those who are new to Ruby, in Ruby, till Ruby 2.2, which just came out uh, on the, this 25th December, uh, it would never uh, garbage collected symbols. So if you create a symbol in Ruby, it would remain till you kill the process. So uh, it's a, like, you have to, uh, you can't just keep creating symbols and uh, expect things to work fine. So what we found out eventually was that at one place where we were parsing JSON, there were non-unique keys, which were timestamps. And every time we were parsing this JSON, we were converting it to symbol, and that was increasing the memory usage. And it was uh, not happening ever, very frequently, but when you had one or two weeks uh, time period, the memory usage would start this well. But till then, so to actually solve this problem, you would need knowledge of Ruby's symbol. Uh, you need to uh, familiar with your code base. You need to know that, okay, I'm parsing JSON here, I'm, and there, are, there is a unique, non-unique JSON key. Uh, there is a unique JSON key coming every single time when I get the response from this server. All that knowledge might not be possible. If the project is very large, you might never know that part of the code base. So till then, to make sure that no customer actually got impacted, we had, a mem uh, we had bounded the memory of each worker. We had something like Monit, which would monitor each worker. And uh, if its memory usage increased a certain threshold, we would kill that worker and restart it. That way, even though we had plenty of time to look for the error to find the root cause, the business was not impacted. And I think this is what design patterns are all about. It's like, till you exactly know what the problem is, it, uh, you're, you won't lose sleep over it, and you would have sufficient time to do it. If we didn't do that, somebody ha would have had to uh, <laughs> be online every time the memory, it would start use, uh, hitting the swap. So these are the patterns I would be covering today. Uh, let's just begin with the very first one, bounding. So uh, in bounding, let's start with timeouts. Uh, how many of you know uh, the, uh, like just raise your hand, how many of you know the uh, Natch HTTP default timeout in Ruby? Like no one? Okay, uh, like uh, you're a keynote speaker. Yeah, so uh, it's 60 seconds. Like uh, it's 60 seconds by default. A lot of Ruby HTTP clients are built over this Natch HTTP library which comes with the uh, MRI by default. So they're also 60 seconds. Okay, what about active uh, record connection pool? Say how much, what's the timeout to get a connection from a connection pool? Like, uh, does anyone know that number? Like no one this time. Uh, that's five seconds. So what you realize is this timeouts are very high. The, this, uh, having this timeouts on a production system under load would be very bad. Uh, I think in the fail fast uh, pattern, I'll explain why this is a very bad behavior to have. But uh, generally, a lot of systems, default timeouts are very high. But the uh, sad part is there are a lot of uh, things uh, in, uh, in your operating system that does not have timeouts by default. Like uh, we, uh, again, the, there was one uh, software we uh, its job was to pick up all the messages from the services and uh, push it to our main queue. Now, the, uh, this, uh, this service was very strange because it would, uh, after two, three weeks, it would actually get hung. It would just stop working. Uh, and uh, there would be critical impact because of it, because messages were not getting delivered to the other service. When we went down, like we using GDP and uh, printing out stack trace uh, uh, by trapping a signal, we found out that it happened, that it was getting blocked uh, on socket.send. So in Ruby, socket.send is a blocking call. The 
we were using a UDP socket, which is fire and forget if, uh, if you still remember. So generally when you send anything on UDP, it's in, uh, it doesn't wait for a response, it's instantaneous. But UDP has a buffer. And when that buffer is full, if you don't have any timeouts or if you're not sending in non-blocking way, the dot send would block permanently till someone actually goes down and uh, I mean restarts it or something like that. And because we were, uh, so to uh, this uh, one bug, and this was something we used to uh, collect matrices and uh, analyze them later. So something that would actually just be for reporting or something was blocking the main feature of the uh, uh, software, which was sending messages. So use timeouts. Evaluate each and every timeout in your system. And, uh, and uh, depending on your service, maybe the acceptable timeout is only 10 seconds. But uh, it wouldn't never be 60 seconds. Second point is uh, bounding. Like one I have already talked about is memory bounding. Like check your worker process, check your that that if after certain threshold, you probably want some kind of behavior, maybe restart it, or maybe clear the memory. So that is one. And finally, I would say in bounding, I would uh, say about this bounding your buffers and your queues. So every uh, if your load on your system is very high, all your UDP buffers, TCP buffers, and say you also have mutex lock in your uh, uh, code base, all of this, would actually form queues. And the sad part of these queues are you have zero control over those queues. So it, uh, you can't do anything if this queue for, uh, form. Instead, the better approach would be to have very restrictive buffer, uh, si buffer sizes for uh, this. And then have your own queue, your own bounded queue for that. Once you have your own bounded queue, you are in control of it. You can easily say apply back pressure. Basically, tell the other service which is sending all the message that hey, I am uh, completely overloaded. Please don't send me more messages or send them uh, at a uh, slower pace. Or uh, you can or you can uh, process those messages uh, differently. But that is something you would only know if you know how many messages are there in your queue and uh, and. Uh, if it's somewhere in your uh, UDP buffer or it's somewhere there in your mutex queue, you would never figure out that uh, how many messages are there to process. Second pattern is circuit breakers. So circuit breakers are one of the patterns popularized by Michael Nygaard in his book, Release It. They are amazing patterns. Uh, uh, it's like, uh, it's really sad that a lot of folks don't know anything about it. Uh, so let me explain uh, this uh, based on the diagram. So you're, you're talking to your client. Uh, your, uh, their circuit breaker is just an intermediate uh, thing that sends to the supplier. And you get a response, and you again send it back to the client. Everything works. But now let's say there is some connection problem, or the other supplier is overwhelmed. So what's happening is while sending the request, it's timing out. You have set your timeout, because now you're following use timeout. So you have a timeout of, say, Two seconds. It's uh, not giving you a response in two seconds. So you're timing out, and and then you're sending that error back to client. Uh, in this case, uh, circuit, uh, any uh, decent circuit breaker implementation would have a fallback mechanism. In case you would call that fallback, that fallback could be a static content, your cache, or anything like that, uh, or it could be not be implemented. Uh, whatever it is, it would time out. After a certain time, it would realize that uh, you would have set a certain threshold of failure for that API. Uh, you would say, OK, in last 10 minutes, it should fail for 30% uh, of the time. If you uh, breach that uh, limit, it would uh, not even, uh, the circuit would uh, trip, and it would go in the open state. In this case, you would not even bother calling the other uh, server. This has two advantages. One is you're not wasting timing out to a service which is failing more time than uh, you desire. Second, that other service might be overwhelmed. And by sending your request there, you are essentially DDoSing that service, which is both the things that you wouldn't want. And 
this is like the very bare minimum of service uh, uh, circuit breakers. After a certain time, what you can do with your circuit breaker is you can move them to a half open state where you would try making calls to the service. If those calls succeed, you can again go back to the initial closed state where everything is fine. Or uh, uh, if things are still not OK, you can remain open and not make the call to that services. Uh, uh, actually, uh, circuit breakers are not just used to uh, talk with other services. Elasticsearch uh, makes uses of circuit breakers. Basically, if you are executing uh, really bad queries in Elasticsearch, and those queries are breaching the time limit that you have set uh, by a certain threshold, uh, it will op uh, open the circuit for that query, and it won't even execute that query. Every time you, uh, in your code that tries to execute that query, it will raise an exception saying that, oh, look, this query is taking a lot of time, and we are not even going to execute it. But this, uh, you save the, uh, so the other queries in your system can still go ahead. In MySQL, there's nothing like that. So in MySQL, if you have a lot of queries running, uh, which are taking uh, time, it will uh, steal all the resources from the uh, queries, the other queries that should be executing. And uh, generally, if you can ask any DevOps or uh, Linux admin, in this case, probably he would have to go to MySQL look at MySQL process list and kill those queries one by one. So the other queries can start executing. So circuit breakers are even used in databases. Uh, and yeah, uh, for implementation of circuit breakers, uh, what I really recommend, if any one of you is using JRuby, I highly recommend you use Hystrix by Netflix. It's a Java library. With JRuby, you can easily use it uh, inside your Ruby code. But if you are on MRI, there is a circuit breaker gem. But frankly, it's not as battle tested as the Netflix uh, Hystrix library. Uh, so yeah, fail fast. So now, in both the uh, previous points, I've been mentioning that you should be failing fast. Uh, that failing fast is much better than you know taking time to do it. Why is that? So uh, I'm just going to need some math for this. So. This is Little's law, which is, uh, comes in under queuing theory. So your length of a queue depends on your how many messages are arriving and how much time your uh, system is taking to process them. So now think about it. Like if you're not failing fast, you're just, uh, and there's something wrong with your server or the service you're talking to, your mean time in the system is going to short up. It's going to be very high, uh, which means uh, your uh, that, uh, your length of the queue is going to increase over time. Uh, so uh, I have a perfect uh, example for this. Say you uh, you are running a business of you know uh, you offer ebooks for download. So you buy the ebook, you pay them through your credit card. Once the payment has been accepted, it goes uh, the ser payment service actually tries to approve the payment, and then you get the downloading. So buy the book, ex uh, pay, payment gets approved, and you get the download link. Now let's say the payment approved is talking to some credit card company servers, and that is down. So by the time it's down and you're not failing fast, what's going to happen is there's going to be a queue build up uh, uh, till that point. And, uh, and let's say it took one hour to, for them to get the service up. Now the, once the service is up, Unless the response times were really, really fast, what's going to happen is, uh, I mean, if the response times are really, really fast compared to the arrival rate, what's going to happen is the folks who are ordering anything now will actually get the order after one hour or whatever the delay is in that system. So uh, say, uh, uh, so that's a very bad experience because on any ebook site, what you see is like, once you purchase the book, it would take one minute for the download leak to appear. And you're breaching those promises every single time. The customer might never even come back and buy things from your site. But let's say you believe in uh, failing fast. You say that, OK, I'll fail fast. So every time uh, we try call, contacting that other credit card service, it fails. You, uh, and you have a circuit breaker implemented. You go to fallback. And in fallback, the only thing you do is you uh, push that message to a different retry queue or something, and say, OK, I'll retry this message later. 
and you clear it from the main message. What does this do is when the service gets up, the people who are placing orders at that moment will actually get it right then and there, like the one minute uh, time that you have promised. And those folks who did not, uh, uh, did not get it in one minute, you can send them a mail because you can say, okay, all the messages in the retry queue are the ones where I actually breached my promise that I promise in one minute and you can send them a mail saying, OK, because of technical difficulties, it's going to take some time. And you can also process those messages. So what, uh, again, uh, if you have noticed in three patterns, what I'm trying to convey is control. What you get here is control. Instead of you know, uh, allowing your operating system or someone else to have the control, it's better that you have the control. Because you understand your domain knowledge, uh, domain logic. You know, you know, if you have an ebook buying website, you would want to have the control to send apology uh, mails or not. Uh, having said that, uh, there is one thing that I really want to show you. Uh, is just one second. Uh, so this is uh, this is queuing theory, uh, and because there was a uh, capacity uh, talk just before this. I just want to quickly show you that how you can actually use queuing theory to do amazing things. So say, let's say you have a single queue. Basically, you have a website where you're getting all your messages from. You have C servers. So let's say C servers would be uh, 20, 15, uh, 20 servers. You would want, uh, uh, you're getting 100 customers per minute, 100 requests per minute, and you're uh, rate is around 15. You can process 15 requests per minute per server. And you have 20 servers like this. This tells you what is your average time or customer, how many customers you serve in a minute. It tells you your load average, which is zero because this number is really high because there are a number of, uh, so let me reduce it. So yeah. So average waiting uh, for each customer to actually get your product is 37.0037 minute. It also gives you entire graph about how much time it has to wait. It can uh, really help you with uh, capacity planning. So yeah. So going back, uh, there's uh, something called the bulkhead. The bulkhead design pattern is actually uh, comes from sh uh, uh, ships. So uh, if you look at any modern ship uh, below deck, there would be, uh, they would be compartmentalized completely. The reason why they do this is, say your ship meets with an accident and water flows through it. Uh, because it's completely compartmentalized, the waters won't, water won't invade the other parts of the system. So even if this one part of the system is down, it does not take out the entire uh, boat with it. And this is the same in services. Say A and B, you have two services A and B, and they talk to service C. Now, unfortunately, the service C goes down. Bo uh, a, both A and B making requests to C uh, are also down. And because now A and B are down, service depending on them are, would also go down. So you can see this is a cascading failure scenario. Like when you have multiple microservices running in your system, uh, uh, in your uh, uh, in your uh, service-oriented architecture. So in this case, uh, this is something do you clearly don't desire. But let's say you use the bulkhead pattern. You have uh, server C, uh, some of the dedicated servers uh, dedicated for service A, and some are dedicated to service B. Uh, for good measures, uh, say their physical uh, hosts don't also go down, so you have put them on different regions of AWS. Uh, so, but this, even if service A can, uh, portion of service C goes down, other services will be still be up because of redundancy that you have introduced. However, bulkheads are not just for services. It could be applied to your uh, uh, single machine as well. So say you have a machine and you have multiple threads running. You can uh, pin a certain thread group to a core and other threads to other core. So even if those uh, threads, uh, that part of the service that, uh, uh, which is using those threads 
start to uh, uh, start to get overloaded, it won't at least make use of other cores. It will only use the cores that it's pinned to. And uh, that way, even though some part of your machine is uh, constantly busy, the other parts are still able to serve requests. And that is uh, uh, what the bulkhead pattern is. And finally, the last pattern that I want to talk about is specifications. Uh, specifications are uh, something that I fe uh, feel a lot of folks have uh, realized that uh, they are not important. But uh, I think uh, Leslie Lampert gave an amazing talk last year called Thinking for Programmers. Uh, you should definitely watch it if you haven't. In specifications, uh, what he says, before you write any code, uh, you write the specification in a stateful manner. So you have a function uh, that takes an argument A and uh, it changes that uh, A to some state B. And if you document that you write this uh, before you do it, you would realize that how sloppy your thinking is. Because uh, what happens is that whenever a person thinks about a case before uh, when he starts coding, he, uh, he only, at most, he's only going to think about the happy case when everything is working fine. He would never consider the uh, cases when the, you know, the, something might be wrong with the system. So with the specification, once you uh, write this down, that this is what I want, you realize that you haven't thought about a lot of cases uh, inside your system. And then that's when you realize that uh, uh, you need to think about the non, not so happy case. So one of the quotes that I have to say is that uh, by Michael Nygaard, the software design only talks about what systems should do, not what systems should not do. And because, uh, uh, because we only address, we, if we only think about that, okay, the happy path case, I can assure you when uh, on production, when you actually uh, encounter a scenario that you didn't think about, things won't go well. You, have, you need to think about it. Uh, this is before you write any sort of code, because even if you do TDD, the amount of test coverage that you would actually do is based on the scenarios that you have thought of. If you haven't thought about a problem well, if you don't really understand any code, uh, understand the problem that you're trying to solve completely, uh, no matter what O patterns or whatever you use, you will never be able to write uh, good code that would actually solve it. And uh, finally, just putting all together, all these patterns, uh, uh, I would highly recommend that uh, if there is one pattern that you can start with, uh, you, uh, I would recommend that you start with specifications. And some of you might think that, you know, maybe my services aren't large enough or big enough to make use of any patterns. But I uh, digress that even the smallest service today is a distributed system. You at least, in the worst case, have, would have a database running on a different server. And you would be communicating through network. And as we all know, the network is uh, not as reliable as we want. Uh, so I would say that at least put some of those uh, patterns in practice. I, uh, I think uh, you can ask any developer who has been on call for a long time. Uh, it's not a really amazing thing to be on. So yeah, that's it. That's my talk. And here are the references. I'll upload with slides, so if you want to know more.